Mark 8, verses 1 through 21. Here's the reading of God's Word. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from, a, from far away. And his disciples answered him, Well, how can one feed these people with, excuse me, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them and got into the boat again and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, In twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Now church, the title of this morning's message is Beware of Religious and Statist Leaven. Mm. Let's pray. Father, I do pray today that you would bless the reading and the proclamation of your word. Now, Lord, unless you do a work today... Your church will not grow. We will not be sanctified. Exalt your son, Jesus Christ, today. May we see a big picture of him. May we realize our state and our frailty. May we come today in repentance. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. The church is midway through about chapter 7 in Mark, uh, beginning at about verse 24 and on. Jesus began a journey where he was going through Gentile territory. And as he's going through, it was a demonstration of his mercy towards the outsiders. It was a demonstration, again, of his miraculous powers. And it was also verification that he is the Messiah of the Old Testament. And he is coming to save his people. And ironically, it was scandalous for many, the fact that his people included not just ethnic Israel, not just the ethnic Jews, but actually the grafted in Gentiles as well. And so we'll examine today, and I really hope we can hammer home this point, that with the inclusion of the Gentiles also comes a very sharp rebuke and judgment of both the callous religious system of his day and of the unbelieving Roman governmental system of his day. So we see here both a rebuke to the Pharisees and to Herod. And in addition, provide a, a teaching opportunity for his disciples to be on alert for the infecting power of both the Pharisees and Herod and all of his cohort. Now, brothers and sisters, I do pray that today we'll be able to see and to hear what God is revealing in his word because it is so relevant for the church today. Now look with me now at verse 1 in our text. Jesus goes again here into Gentile territory. We see those words, in those days. Meaning the days where he was in the Decapolis, Mark 7, 31. 
So this was a predominantly Gentile area. It was on the, the far eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And as he's there, again, a large crowd gathers to him. We see that all throughout the Gospel accounts. Christ draws a crowd. And now, church, it's really in these first ten verses that I simply want to just draw some commentary. So this is not going to be a normal exegetical treatment. We have a lot of verses to cover here, but just add some commentary to the first ten verses. Now, the reason being is because it's twofold. Number one, this is the second mass feeding of people that Jesus does within the Gospels. But then secondly, this narrative of his feeding actually leads into the thesis of the text. So this is going to lead us to the main point. So the first comment here to note is that some have argued, some critical scholars have argued this point that this feeding of the 4,000 is simply a repeat narrative of when he fed the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. Now let me just ask you, this is a rhetorical question, so don't raise your hand, but how many of you actually thought that Jesus only did a mass feeding one time? Some people believe that, and I've believed that before. But no, friends, he did it twice. And it's actually very intentional, as we're going to see within this text, why Jesus fed 5,000 and why he fed the 4,000. The second note I want to have a little bit of commentary here on this is I want to draw now the similarities between the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6, verses 30 through 44, and in our passage here in Mark 8, verses 1 through 10. So here are the similarities between the two feedings. In both instances, we see again there's a large group of people around Jesus. We see that in verse 1 of our text. It's in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. In both instances, it says very specifically, Jesus has compassion upon the people. See that in verse 2 of our passage. In both instances, Mark 6 and Mark 8, the disciples question the ability to actually feed the people. Now, friends, I find this absolutely amazing because this is now the second time Jesus is feeding a mass group of people and they're questioning the ability for it to actually happen. Which again proves the point why we need to see repetition in teaching. In both accounts, in Mark 6 and Mark 8, Jesus asked, well, what are the provisions? Well, how many loaves do we have? What, what sort of food do we have out there? That's verse 5 in our text. Then, of course, in both passages, in Mark 6 and Mark 8, Jesus multiplies the food. We see that in verses 6 through 8 in our passage here. And then also, very interesting, in both Mark 6, when he fed 5,000, in our passage, after Jesus does the miracle, he leaves and he's challenged immediately by the Pharisees. So those are some similarities between the two feeding accounts. But now let me give you some of the differences. So this is a, sort of our third point here in regards to commentary, some of the differences between Mark 6 and Mark 8. In Mark 8, you see that Jesus says that the people are with him for three days. In Mark 6, it was just one day. In Mark 8, there's seven loaves. In Mark 6, there's only five loaves. In Mark 8, there's seven baskets that are left over as opposed to the 12 baskets that are left over in Mark 6. Now, why are we going through all this, at least this commentary here? It's to prove the point, friends, that there's actually two distinct feeding accounts. The, the critical scholars are wrong on this. There are two accounts. One of the reasons is because, I said this earlier, repetition is an amazing teacher. It's a great teacher. We know that with our children, don't we? You don't tell them no once. It turns out you have to tell them no many, many times for them to actually understand that. And Jesus' disciples here, they need to be trained. He's discipling his people here. Now, friends, I, I really want to continue to, to state this. I know I've said this before, but discipleship happens best by not simply teaching, not just Bible studies, but by experiencing. I mean, some of the, the best discipleship will happen with your children in your home as you're just doing normal activities. Or if we're on the streets and we're ministering together. You want to you wanna be discipled? Come out and minister with brothers and sisters in whatever capacity that looks like. 
whether it be in your home with others or out in the streets, and that's where discipleship is really happening. So our Lord here, He's discipling His people, isn't He? He's doing it through the use of repetition. But not only that, the second miraculous feeding account is also, and get this please, this is to a completely different group of people than before. This time it's primarily the Gentiles. So in Mark 6, when he fed the 5,000, it was Jewish men, women, and children. In our passage here, he's feeding 4,000 of a mixed crowd, but it's predominantly Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people. So friends, I want you to now, now think, as we're preaching through all of Mark, I want you to put together the full structure of what's happening here. So you can get the flow of the passage. Jesus does a mass feeding in Mark 6 to, to Jewish people. Right after that, he has a series of interactions with the Pharisees in regards to traditions and commandments and what it means to be clean and unclean. Jesus then goes into an unclean territory, performs miracles, and right after that does another mass feeding to the Gentiles. You see how that, that kind of, those are the bookends here. This is what it looks like to be unclean. Oh, let me go and do some miracles here and I'm going to actually feed them. This is a big narrative that Mark is showing us here by the Holy Spirit. And in this, this is what we need to see. Jesus came to have compassion on both the Jew and the Gentile. Amen. I know we've hammered that home the last few sermons in Mark, but let me state it again. God so loved the world, the world meaning God loves Jews and He loves Gentiles. Jesus came to save his people from their sins through his life, his death, and his resurrection. And so the servant of God you read about in Isaiah 49, it says he's coming to shine forth a light to the nations. The nations are the Gentiles. Or Jesus said to himself in John 10, 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also. Amen. And they will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock. And there will be one shepherd. Translation, Jesus came to shepherd one flock of Jews and Gentiles. And we see this happening here in the second feeding account. As he's now feeding the Gentiles. And friends, this is why we read Ezekiel 34 earlier. He's gathering his people together. A greater David has now come to be set up over all the people. And now he's feeding and he's gathering them. I want you to see that church. Now, after the feeding account here, that was the commentary on that section. Look at verse 10 now. Jesus immediately got into the boat to travel to the district of Dalmanutha. Your manuscript, some manuscripts will say uh, Magdala. But basically, this was on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. So they're on the eastern shore in Decapolis. Get in the boat, they go directly to the other side of the sea. And now they're on the western shore. The point is, they're now back in Jewish territory. And upon arriving, verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Notice the, all those buzzwords that come at you here. They come to argue with him. They're seeking from him. No, they're not seeking him. They're seeking from him. And what are they seeking? A sign from heaven to test him. Friends, this is not a welcome party back into Jewish land. They are here to harass and to interrogate Jesus. Now, brethren, what are they seeking from him? A sign of his divinity. Show me that you're God. Show me that you're the anointed one that's supposed to be coming. Let me see that you're actually the Messiah. Now, friends, Jesus has done many signs. We have an entire gospel record, right? seven chapters so far of Jesus' signs and his power that he's revealing to the people. We can recall one instance in particular in Mark chapter 3. Um, you see, specifically Mark 3, 22, he's casting out demons. And the scribes come to Jesus and begin to criticize him that, oh, you're doing these signs and wonders by the power of Beelzebub. They say he's doing it by the prince of demons, by Satan himself. And so instead of Jesus just simply giving them another sign here, 
as we've already seen him do, do many, many signs. Instead, in verse 12, he declares, no sign will be given to this generation. First, I want to make this very clear. In the gospel record, when you see that phrase, this generation, it's speaking immediately to the people that Jesus is speaking with you. No sign is going to be given to you. Now, why do I say that? Because there's a first century context I want to make sure we, we grab here. We can capture this. Jesus comes as the final capital P prophet given in Deuteronomy 18. He's coming to speak to his people, the Jews, to flee from the wrath to come. But just because he's speaking to that generation during that time does not mean that that limits the application for us. Because brothers and sisters, we live in a generation much like Jesus did. A wicked generation. A generation that seeks, but never seems to find. See friends, the Pharisees here are like the skeptic on the street who comes up to you and makes some audacious claim. I don't believe in God. And if there is a God, you need to prove it to me. Prove it to me. Show me a sign that your God actually exists. The irony is, is that when that person does that, when that atheist makes that claim to you, as our brother mentioned earlier, they're living in a nation that was built upon Christian principles. As they're taking the very breath that God is giving to them, they have the audacity to make the claim, show me a sign that your God exists. <laughs> and friends, what do many Christians do if you? Christians even evangelize. We know 95% of never shared the gospel. If they do evangelize, they give them a sign. They want to continue to give them evidence and continue to give them proof. For example, well, let me explain to you the evidence of the resurrection. Let me explain to you the veracity of the scriptures. As if God is on trial or something. We do not need to prove to people that God exists because He has revealed Himself to them. That's what Romans 1 says. They are suppressing God's truth. And so, why doesn't Jesus just give the Pharisees another sign? He could just silence them here. He could give them even more evidence. He doesn't do it because the Pharisees know. They know just like the atheists. And they're suppressing the truth. Friends, they had the Torah. They had the entirety of the scriptures that promised that, that the Messiah was coming. Friends, they were even given a timeline in Daniel 9 when he was going to come. They would know this, but friends, it was not enough for them. And that's the point. It's never enough for a wicked and a privileged generation. And I say privileged just to trigger some of you. A privileged generation. We live in a privileged generation, don't we? Our nation. I'm not talking about white privilege. I'm not talking about the fact that we're privileged with our economic status. I'm talking about the fact that we live in America. We are a land that is saturated with Bibles. We have churches galore. In my little town of Middletown, less than 2,000 people in that little town where you can throw three rocks and you can go across the entire town there. We have seven churches. Seven churches in that little town. And yet, what has our nation done? We're asking the question, well, where is God? Where is He? Meanwhile, we've abandoned Him in our schools. We've walked away from Him in the civil sphere. And we have the audacity to ask such a question. This is what it looks like to be an entitled and a wicked generation that never has enough. Now, friends, a Time magazine, this is in 2013, labeled the millennial generation, which, by the way, that's me, so I'm within this group. We are the me, me, me generation. And then the subtitle, the generation of lazy and, nar and entitled narcissists. It's us. It's my generation. I can see that. But, brothers and sisters, let me make sure I can clarify here. We in America are the me, me, me generation. We are the most privileged people to walk on planet Earth 
with the amount of Bibles we have, I can tap into John MacArthur's teaching any time I want, or John Piper, or any gifted brother I want today, and yet we are the most ungodly people walking on planet Earth. Why is it so hard to evangelize in our nation today? Because like the Pharisees, a narcissistic generation would rather test God than submit to Him. Mm. And friends, it's sad to say we see it within many people in the pew today. If God doesn't fit in your little box of how you conceive Him to be, people will outright reject Him. Mm. Have you ever heard it said before? It's a puny, weak God. I could never worship a God like that. Try it out, friends. Find a neighbor who's a believer. Bring to them a hard doctrine. Actually, start easy. The doctrine of hell. It's so clearly given. Start there. Or maybe the doctrine that says, as our brother mentioned earlier, guess what, friends? Sodomy is a sin. And if you believe that, and you hold to the fact that um, sodomy, sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God, you will go to hell. Mm. That will send you to hell. Or get this, if you're sleeping with someone today who's not your spouse, and you're unrepentant, God will cast you into hell. Preach that today, and they will walk out of here, and they will never come back. And I've seen it happen multiple times in this church. Why is this? Because God doesn't sit doesn't fit your little preconceived paradigm, and you would rather argue with him than submit to him. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because, church, that's exactly what Jesus runs into in our text. A group of religious men who have this preconceived idea of who Jesus should be. And when Jesus actually shows up to them, God in the flesh is coming, standing before them, they reject him. They want to test him instead of embrace him. They want to question him instead of answer to him. And so in response, look back at verse 12 in our text. Jesus sighs deeply in his spirit. Friends, Jesus at this point, he's at the point of exasperation. Our Lord Jesus is fully God and fully man. He has reached his human limits. In Matthew 16, it calls this generation a wicked and adulterous generation. They've rejected him and no sign will be given to them. We see also in the gospel records, even if a man is to rise from the dead, you still wouldn't believe. Let me tell you something, church. Don't cast pearls before pigs. Don't give evidences to those that will trample our Lord and Savior underfoot. Instead, you call them to repent. And if they reject you, you wipe the dust off your feet. Let me just tell you a quick anecdote. We were in downtown Indy the other day, and we ran into the Black Lives Matter movement. And as soon as they found out we were there to share the gospel with them, it immediately turned hostile, and they wanted to start fighting. Well, as we left and realized this is not good, we're not throwing, we're not going to cast pearls before big pigs. Guess what they said to us? Wipe off the dust off your feet as you walk away. They knew it. Their heart was so hard, they knew that we should wipe off the dust of our feet as we left that group of people. And so look what happens in verse 13. Jesus departs. He departs. He leaves them. Jesus gets into the boat, and they go all the way back over to the other side. Get this, church. The glory of God is departing from the religious leaders. Jesus is the glory of God, and He's leaving them. Do you see the foreshadowing here? He is leaving them in their sin. Just like the glory of God left the Old Testament temple in the book of Ezekiel, Jesus is departing from the Jewish leaders. And as he and his disciples get into the boat to travel across to the other side of the sea, in verse 14 we see the disciples, they, they forgot to bring the bread. Everything's coming around now. Everything's coming, the story's coming full circle. They forgot they had seven baskets full of loaves, and now they only have one loaf remaining. And Jesus cautions them in verse 15, Watch out! Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. We know that leaven is, of course, a substance that's placed within a dough, 
in just a small amount, it will leaven the entire loaf. It will infect the entire loaf and cause it to rise. I mean, this is amazing if you're making pizza. That's really the only time I've ever used it. If you're baking bread, this is a wonderful blessing, isn't it? I mean, how many of us like to go to Texas Roadhouse and get those amazing rolls that rise and they're so yummy? And Jesus actually uses this as a blessing. And Matthew 13, 33 gives a parable that the kingdom of God is like this, a little leaven that goes in and leavens the entire loaf. It's the kingdom of God expanding throughout the entire world. Mm. But friends, aside from that parable, leaven is usually described in a negative sense. Mm -hmm. Because leaven corrupts. Leaven destroys. Let me give an example here. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. Leaven is associated with pride and malice and wickedness. In Galatians 5, 9, it's associated with the heresy of the Judaizers in the Galatian church. And so Jesus' caution here is very pointed. It's very sharp to them. Watch out. Watch out for their hypocrisy and their hardness of heart and their influence. And we know this, 1 Corinthians 15, bad company corrupts good morals. Watch out for them. But the disciples at this point, they still have their mind on physical bread. They're thinking here, they've lost this, the spiritual plane of what's going on. And so Jesus then offers a harsh exhortation and correction to them. Look at verses 17 and 18 again. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? How can your hearts be this hardened? In other words, you've seen all this revelation. All the signs affirm that Jesus is the Son of God. He even caused a mute man to sing for joy. Isaiah 35, that was a fulfillment that God is coming to save His people. How can they not perceive it? Are they, are the disciples like in the parable of the four soils? Are they like the walking path that when the seed hits the ground... Satan comes and snatches it away? Are they like the unbelieving Pharisees that have ears but can't seem to hear? They have eyes but they can't actually see the truth? Come on, disciples, don't you remember? Could it be here that their familiarity with Christ has caused them to grow hard to the truth? Or perhaps the leavening influence of the Pharisees in Herod's unbelief is now rubbing off on the disciples. And so Jesus recalls for them the two feeding miracles in verses 19 and 20. Look at this again. When I broke the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. Now, please hear this. I don't want to hang an entire argument based upon numbers. And how to interpret symbols in the Bible. But this one is unbelievably clear. And it affirms the ministry of Christ. When Jesus fed 5,000, he picks up 12, doesn't he? 12 baskets. What does 12 represent in the scriptures time and time again? 12 tribes, 12 disciples, Israel, the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. When he feeds the 4,000, he collects seven baskets. Seven is a number of perfection and completion. Meaning that in Jesus, the completion of his mission is both to the Jews and it also includes the Gentiles. That's the completion of his mission as Jew and Gentile. And by the way, his supply here is, of course, abundant with the fact that there are multiple baskets left over. And so he says to them in verse 21, do you not yet understand? Don't you get this? Disciples, you should see this is my mission. This is why you gathered 12 and you gathered 7. I came for both Jews and Gentiles. You mean it's not just Jewish lives matter? Not just Jewish lives matter? No, friends. Jewish and Gentile lives matter because the shepherd is coming to gather his sheep from all the four corners of the earth. Now, why the caution and the warning here, though? He's pointing them back to something, but he gives them a, a very sharp warning. Was it just because they didn't understand? Well, look back at verse 15. 
think this is the thesis of this, this entire text here, verse 15. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, or the Herodians, yours may say. Because the disciples, if they aren't careful, they will be just like the Pharisees, and they will be just like Herod. They will be like those who are the Herodians who are in allegiance to Rome. The Pharisees, they simply wanted to test Jesus, and eventually they wanted to destroy him. Herod was seeking Jesus too, but not in a salvation way. No, he was seeking Jesus to discredit him in a sense of mockery and shame. And so later here between the Pharisees and between Herod, they both had hard hearts at the truth and reality of Christ. And even when he's in their midst, they reject him. And so in one sense, the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod is unbelief. The wicked generation of the Pharisees and the Herodians and of Herod, it will infect you if you're not careful. Watch out. And friends, ironically, the Jewish leaders and the Roman, the ones in, in allegiance to Rome, the Romans here, they're the ones that find their way to put Jesus on the cross. It's these two groups. I mean, could you imagine how this warning would come to someone like Judas? Watch out for the leaven of these groups, because if you don't, you will be just like them. Your heart will grow hard and you'll reject Christ. And Judas fell right into the trap and became an accomplice in the, in the murder of Jesus our Lord. Now at this point, let me just now apply this to you. What does this look like? Because this warning here is specifically for them, but this instruction is for us as well. How do we take this warning regarding the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Isn't it interesting in this passage that Jesus warns of two groups, two categories of people? You have the religious figureheads of the day and the political figureheads of the day. Let me ask you a question. Who are the two most dangerous people or groups of people in our society today? It's rhetorical. You don't have to shout it out. False religious teachers and corrupt civil leaders, right? Why is this? Because false religious teachers will sneak into the church under this facade of religiosity, and they will bring corruption, and they will lead people astray. And the leaders of a corrupt state, because of their hearts of unbelief, who side with Caesar, they will bring a completely different religion known as humanism. They will seek salvation by law and by force and by the sword. In other words, Jesus is warning the disciples, those that will be then the apostles that are sent out to begin the early church. They are the pillars of the church. There are two threats you need to watch out for. There are the 11 of those inside the church that will corrupt from within. And there is the leaven and corruption of those outside the church in the form of a tyrannical government. Let me address these two groups. First off, the leaven of the religious. The leaven of the religious. The Pharisees, they were the enemies within the religious system of the day. They thought they had exclusive rights to the kingdom because of their education and because of their ethnic makeup. Much like the religious men of our day, they want to do a lot of fine splicing between clean and unclean. They're the exegetes. These are the men in the ivory towers, the PhDs. They have an appearance of godliness, but they're full of dead men's bones. Church, listen to me. Beware of these men. Beware of the leaven of the religious elites and the TV showmen of our day. Beware of men like Matt Chandler and Albert Moeller. The once esteemed conservative leaders of our day who have compromised to the latest agendas in social justice and critical race theory. Beware of them, church. Beware of men like Francis Chan that so many people esteem today. Beware of his wayward drift into apostasy. Now, you're saying at this point, hold on. These are the conservatives. So were the Pharisees. Yep. They were the conservatives of the day. 
I'm telling you now, church, beware of them. Watch out, lest they take you as prey. These men have slowly faded. We've seen it over the years. They're fading away. These men are. They're being taken captive by empty thoughts and philosophies, and they will take you by their smooth speech. I've seen my own friends in seminary I've sat with that have fallen into this, this liberalism. It will take you if you aren't aware of their leaven. Church, be aware of organizations like the Gospel Coalition and their leavening effect. Friends, anytime you either add to, you subtract from, or you begin to water down the Gospel message, that is what corrupting leaven looks like. And that's what Jesus is warning about here. I mean, friends, just this week, just one example. I saw an article that was pushed out by Brent McCracken from the Gospel Coalition over the reasons why Christians must, even though you hate it, you must wear a mask because this is now a gospel issue. Yeah. One of the reasons, Romans 13, unlimited obedience to the civil government. There was no solid exegetical argument. This is just someone coming in and leading people astray into statism. And that's just one example of this, of what's going on in their rhetoric. Never mind their affirmation of same-sex attractive leaders within the church. Friends, it's sickening. Yep. And all it takes for you is just a little bit of leaven, and you begin to consume it, and it's good. And they take you away, and you are corrupt just like them. Church, hear me. Beware of men like Stephen Furtick and T.D. Jakes. Hmm. These men, people love them because it sounds so good and it's uplifting and they speak with so much gusto and enthusiasm. But they will spout dreadful truths to you that will send you to hell. Listen, friends, Stephen Furtick preaches full-on heresy. He says that Jesus Christ broke the law of God. He has gone into full-blown prosperity gospel over the last couple of years. T.D. Jakes denies the Trinity. Yep. You're saying, Kim, why are you naming names? I don't like to do this. Because Jesus does here. He says, beware of the Pharisees. They just saw them. They were just interacting face to face with a specific group of people. And he goes and tells his disciples, beware of these men. Beware of false teachers within the church, because if you don't caution yourself, you will be captivated by them, and you will be just like them. That's the warning Jesus is giving to his disciples. Their wayward drift will take you off the narrow path. Hmm. Now the second group of people that are addressed here, of potential threats, come from outside the church. Men like Herod, the tetrarch of Jesus' day. Friends, Herod was the puppet of Rome. Rome was the enemy that raged war against the early church. Rome was the one who imprisons Paul. They're the one who kills Paul with the sword. The Romans are the one who are able to bear the sword and put Jesus Christ on the cross. Beware of them and him and Herod. Why? Because the state wants to provide for you a salvation outside of Christ. In other words, a corrupt state they will do anything to come in and find the place as the Savior. Remember, friends, the early church confession was Jesus is Lord. While those in allegiance to the state said Caesar is Lord. Mm. Political statements there. Salvation statements. Friends, the state provided a shelter and military protection from its enemies. That was the beauty of being in the Roman Empire. The Pax Romana, there was peace within Rome. And if you're covered by Rome, you're protected. You're protected. But friends, they're a terrible savior. Because humanistic laws will never save you. They will put you in more and more bondage. If you don't believe me, we can look around and we can see where we are today. We've abandoned our Lord and his law, and he's given us wicked rulers in exchange. Church, beware of messianic figures that take power in our nation and in our state. That people look to today for relief and for bailouts and security and discipleship and oversight. Beware of them because the federal beast wants to come and gobble you up if you aren't careful. Now please make sure you hear what I'm saying here. A faithful government 
under the lordship of Christ is an amazing blessing. They're called a minister of God in Romans 13. But a corrupt government will seek to devour those who put their faith in Christ. Listen to me, church. It's coming to us. It's coming. It's here now. In our own nation. Set your face like flint to Christ now. You must. You must. Because the leaven of Washington, D.C., the leaven of Herod and of Caesar is coming for the church. Church, who persecuted the early church after the death, burial, resurrection of Christ? Two groups. The apostate Jews in Rome. That's who came after the church. The apostate Jews, they're called the agent of Satan throughout the scriptures. In Rome is declared in the book of Revelation as the beast. This is where Jesus' caution comes from. Beware of them. Their hearts are hard and their leaven of unbelief will take you with them if you do not take caution. Now, friends, you can actually imagine, though, the lure and the draw of these two groups for the young, maturing disciples. Because they're vulnerable. In the state, or Herod will offer a security blanket for them if they simply just kiss the ring of Caesar. While the Pharisees will offer for them religious prestige. Everybody wants that, right? And you get religious prestige without persecution if you're with the Pharisees. And it can be so enticing for them, and it can also be enticing for us, friends. But do not be taken captive to it. Have eyes to see and ears to hear this. Welcome to 21st century America. We have our own Pharisees. We have our false teachers of the day that want to stroke your ego. They want to tell you how good you are and give to you moral stories and preach to you sweet things. But in their end is the way of destruction. In the state, well, we see that in 2020, friends, they're coming after the church. To not fall in this trap, what's the solution? The solution is what Jesus gives us here. Remember. Remember. Don't you remember, disciples? Look to Christ, friends. That's what we remember. Look to the saving work of Jesus. That those who follow Him must be committed to dying with Him and rising with Him in glory. This is how you will have a life that is full of devotion. Remember the two feedings of the 5,000 and the 4,000. Remember His mission is to both Jew and Gentile. This will keep you from falling into the trap of Black Lives Matter, friends. Do you see how grounding this is? When you remember what Jesus does for two groups of people? Because he's bringing them into one new man, Ephesians 2. Mm -hmm. Remember that no more signs are needed. Friends, our generation doesn't need any more signs from God. We've been given the full revelation in God's word, which means the scriptures are sufficient for us to equip us for every good work. Remember, church, the bread of life is what satisfies, not the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. The, the solution is look to Christ, brethren. Look to Christ. This is what Jesus wants his disciples to focus on. Remember that Jesus is the true king. He's greater than Herod. He's the true rabbi. He's much greater than the Pharisees. He's the shepherd of the sheep who comes to feed his, feed his own people. By God's grace, friends, our church will not be taken captive by the enemies that are so cleverly coming in. And they are taking people with good doctrine and they are taking them astray in droves now. Mm -hmm. They really are. Yep. May we not be taken captive by these philosophies and thoughts. Brothers and sisters, this is a message of warning for you. This is what the scriptures gave us. Mark 8, 1 through 21. Watch out. Beware. It's a message of warning today. May Jesus Christ be glorified. May we fix him high in the sky and see him as our king and as our Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the preservation of it. I do pray you would continue to do a work in the hearts of your people. Transform us into one degree of glory to the next. Father, I pray as, as we transition into our time of taking of the Lord's Supper that we would see that 